this is Startup Storefront. Let me give you a scenario. You try and purchase something on your debit card, but you don't have enough money in your account. Instead of declining the purchase, your bank allows it to go through and charges you $35 for the convenience. Overdraft fees accounted for $5.8 billion of bank revenue in the first three quarters of 2022. These fees harm millions of Americans every year, and they can trap people into a cycle of debt. Jason Wilk, the founder of Dave, also struggled with these fees. What frustrated him the most was that if the bank just looked at his recent transaction history, they would be able to see a scheduled paycheck coming in in only a couple of days. And in that frustration, Dave was born. Dave is an online bank that offers no interest loans based on your transaction history in order to avoid overdraft fees. In today's episode, we discuss with Jason about how Mark Cuban invested in Jason's first company only to cap his salary at $30,000 per year, going from the euphoria of an IPO to watching the stock price tumble a few days later, and what it was like transitioning from the CEO of a privately traded company to a publicly traded one. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Jason, CEO of Dave. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. People who don't know, what's Dave? Dave is one of the leading neobanks in the country. We neobank. Offer, neobank is a digital bank with no bank branches. Okay. That's how we sort of define it. Okay. And we don't have a bank license. We partner with a bank to hold all our deposits. So that's what separates a bank from a neobank. But the benefit of us is we're digitally focused and our cost structure compared to major banks is so limited, which allows us to offer products at significantly cheaper prices than incumbents. When you started the company, what was the idea? Like, what did you see? What was the problem you were trying to solve? Yeah, it was very simple. Overdraft fees. Okay. They suck today. They still suck. They suck major all banks, the time. Major banks still charge $34 for taking your account negative for every instance. So yeah. you can still get charged at... JP Morgan Chase, a hundred bucks a day for oh, wow. having a negative balance. What what do these banks collectively take in overdraft fees? Like how big is that? It's been reduced over the years, especially since companies like us have come out sure. to try and disrupt the industry. It's sure. still shockingly large. It's like fifteen to twenty billion dollars a year of, of just fees. in overdraft fees. Just in overdraft fees. And you figure that's wow. affecting the lowest income earners of the population the most. That's right. right. Yeah. It's roughly eighty percent of, of the people that are paying overdraft fees are are comprised of the majority of the of the fees. All right. So you so you saw this in the market. You go, OK, cool. Overdraft fees. Let's fix it. Yeah. Well, I was I was the overdrafter. So right. I had the personal experience and I knew it was something that could be disrupted. Were you in college or how old, or just out of college? How I had the idea during college, but it really became a lot more prevalent when I had my my second company that was uh, it was a white combinator backed business. And Mark Cuban was our lead investor and started this company it was called All Screen TV. And the idea was to effectively help media companies distribute their online video content to other smaller websites. So if I'm CNN, I can take my digital video content and give it to localnews.com and then give a rev share basis. So it was a great model for helping people drive more views and everybody sort of wanted the model. But started the business in 2009 when we're just coming out of the, yeah, the financial, uh, crisis. financial crisis, very hard to raise funding. We didn't have this crazy unicorn investment environment that we have had the last 10 years. And it was a real fight to get anyone to invest. I fortunately had been introduced to Mark Cuban a couple of years prior to that at a conference. And this is pre Shark Tank. So he was still kind of getting his feet wet in, yeah. in investing. But I knew for some reason I had this like a lot in common with this guy. I really was sort of inspired by him and emailed him a bunch to try and get him to invest in the company the criteria for him to invest, he's like, all right, this kid's a hustler, and I'm not sure if I love this idea or not, but I'm going to give him a shot, but I'm going to cap his salary at $30,000 a year. He capped your salary. Until the company gets profitable. <laughs> so. <laughs> that sounds so absurd. Yeah. And I was living oh in San Francisco God. at the time, too. How much did he invest? Can, back can, and, can you forth. disclose that? Uh, I think I can disclose. You put 300 k in total into the business. And he capped you at thirty. Yeah. That's crazy. Caught me at 30K. Okay. And you were okay with it. Obviously, he ran the spy. You were like, I'm in. I had no other choice. Yeah. He okay. was the, I really wanted you to wanted him as an investor. investor. Yeah. Holy shit. I was young, so I didn't need a lot to live off of. Mark himself got his start living off of couches. And so I'm like, yeah, you know, sign me up. If I get Mark Cuban's name yeah. associated with mine, it's worth it to have this cap salary and we'll get the company profitable. And it taught us a lot of discipline 
early on. I had a co-founder too, who okay. was also, also capped, capped at thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> you guys sharing a bed? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, it led to us both getting hit with a lot of overdraft fees, and that stuck with us all the way through to the next company. So it was, it was great discipline for us to get profitable. The company, we ended up selling it in 2015. We had like $7 million in cash flow in our final year in 2015. So like wildly profitable. Yeah. We never raised a cent of venture capital beyond what we raised from Mark and a couple other people in that wow. early round. So it was a good early lesson yeah. in profitability, keeping companies lean, and I tried to carry as much as that through to, to building Dave. So how, how many years are you at 30K? We were at 30K probably for the first three years. Okay. And then we finally started turning a profit. And, and then Mark the must and love you. He must be like, this is amazing. Lifted. Yeah, he was you loving it. You figured it out. You yeah, did it. He was loving the profitability. You sold for a successful exit, I imagine. We did. Yeah, yeah. We, we only raised one round of funding. We sold for $85 million, That's amazing. Uh, yeah. five, five or six years later. And again, at the time, the company was very profitable. Yeah. So we, a good story. we did it. Looking back on that story, we can get into David in a second, but if you, you, invest, you invest in companies? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So would you ever do the same thing? Would you ever cap them at a, obviously not 30,000, maybe it's 50,000 or 60,000. Would you do the same play? It's just changed so much now where, you know, back then, like we raised money, like a million dollar valuation. That was like a huge wild success in 2009. Now you're raising funding at 10 million, 20 yeah, million dollar valuation. These guys are taking yeah. secondary. There's just so much money flying around over the last decade since uh, we were in that, that frame of mind. And I don't think you could pull it off as an investor today, at least not into any kind of company that has trajectory or any kind of progress so far. Yeah. All right. So then you go into Dave and Mark doubles down with you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Exactly. From more the like, jump. More like take, you know, he's playing with house money at this point, sure. yeah. but he liked the idea because he himself was an overdrafter when he was in school. Yeah. And even when he was getting his start as an entrepreneur, I think Mark was like a bartender living on couches and also hated overdraft. What year was this when you started it? Dave, we so started that in 2016 okay. is when we started like ideating on what's the product to bring to market that we could help. And what year did disrupt. you sell Allscreen? 2015. Okay. 2015. Funny. I, I remember like in Boston. So during opening day in Boston, if you go uh, and you're a college student, there's all, all the banks are there. So Bank of America and they give you tickets. Yeah, so if you, uh, if you open up an account, they'll give you two tickets to the game, like opening day sure. and, and it's free. But if, if you're not a college student, so if you don't have a college ID, I think just to open the account is like $35. I think it's $35 mm -hmm. just to open the account, right. not an overdraft fee. And I was like, this is so absurd. It's like I'm giving you my money it just, and, 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 and I'm and giving well, you money on top of that. But also it's like, know your market. Like the what college kid is about to just drop $35 to open up for the luxury of none. It doesn't right. exist. Yeah. That's right. So such a weird, okay. So you saw this, Mark saw it. You, I get the overdraft fee makes sense. Yeah, we both, we both saw it. And the vision was, look, we want to go out and compete with these major banks. And I want a name that's going to be very approachable, that has this kind of fighter mentality with it. And so we came up with the name Dave for kind of like Dave versus Goliath, but we're also this casual name that's very approachable compared to these big fancy bank names. Okay. So that was the genesis of why the company was called Dave. Like no one really in my family named Dave. It just seemed like the right thing to call it. Dave.com. Were yeah. there other iterations that you played with? No, that was it. Okay. But yeah, we wanted the name Dave. We spent a good amount of money buying Dave.com early on. Who owned it? But was it like a pet store? I, remember, I think th there was like Dave's Pet City where I grew up. Hmm. There was a guy named Dave in San Francisco. He had owned the name like a domain squatting since the yeah. since the '90s, and it was just like a uh, like a 404 landing page. But there was an email address to try and contact him. Yeah. Sent him a dozen notes, never responded. Started firing off offers in the in the email as well. He finally responded, and I wanted to raise, I wanted to buy the domain before we raised funding, and he got, you know, saw who our investors were, and so I ended up buying it for like 120,000 bucks. Wow. And that was a, a, a for big, him, a, a good big chunk of our seed round. <laughs> I think he thought that was a really good deal. I think it was probably pretty fair at the time. And like, who else is going to come in and buy that besides Dave and Busters or something? I think they were already happy with their domain name. Right. So now you start the company, and it's 2015. You go, 16. 16. You go app based. That seems obvious at that time. Yeah. Do you also have an online? Is it? No. No. It's been just app, all app based from day one. Okay. And then your target demo you felt was you, you or, or I guess like the younger college, maybe post college student. Exactly. That's the person. That's right. And then how do you go about getting them? Is it as simple as you go to the colleges and you set up booths or is it? What's no. the thing? 
Well, so much of today's success in direct-to-consumer, especially for app-based companies, they're all sort of such a hits-driven business. You know within a couple of weeks if you have product market fit based on Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. Google advertising alone. Like, is this thing going to have scale? And is it going to have any kind of uh, word of mouth associated with it? You can test all that stuff pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah. The hypothesis we had was that we, all, we knew we ultimately wanted to be a full-on digital bank account for customers but very expensive to acquire people into a checking account. And people don't wake up in the morning excited to open up a brand new checking account. That's why banks have to pay so much money to be able to open an account. So we took a very different approach, approach, much more of like a Trojan horse idea where Dave was an app that would monitor your existing bank account for a potential overdraft. We would send you a notification. Wow. And as opposed to you going negative on your Chase or Wells Fargo account, it'd say, hey, Diego, you have a Netflix bill coming up that's gonna take your account negative by $35, that's gonna cost you 34 bucks, or you can take an advance from Dave, no interest, no credit check. We can look at your Wells Fargo transaction data to approve you, wow. and basically can offer you this money at little to no cost. That's amazing. And the reason we thought that would work is, it was always upsetting to me that I would bank with Chase or Wells for years. They know where I work, they know my transaction history, why do they have to charge me a $34 fee when they know I'm going to get paid on Friday? I've been a loyal, loyal customer for 13 years, so it seems crazy to charge that fee. Yeah. So our hypothesis was, look, we're going to look at that transaction data. We can pretty, in, pretty quickly tell through a machine learning model when your next paycheck date is and how much it's going to be and offer that at no interest and rely instead of on fees, let people tip us yeah. was the, the early idea there. So you could pay what you think is fair for the amount of money that you borrow. So if I give you a hundred bucks, you could tip me two or three dollars, zero dollars, <laughs> completely that's, that's, optional. That's amazing. So how many people, so this reminds me of something not really related, but like when Radiohead came out with their In Rainbows album, they allowed it, whatever, pay whatever you wanted. Yep. And most people assumed that they'd just get it for free. And for a large chunk of consumers, that was true. But what shocked, I think the music industry was that most people ended up paying yeah. something for the album. Is that what you found with the tipping? Is that even though most people could pay zero, did most people end up giving you money because they were grateful for the offer? Yeah, look at, listen, uh, Radiohead was definitely an early inspiration for the tip model. We'd also seen the tipping model work well in Asia with, with gaming companies and, and with uh, social media type type situations. Plus, tipping in general just seemed to be entering the culture a little bit more aggressively. So you're used to tipping your Uber driver, your barista and all that. So why not tip an app that's giving you free money? That would seem to be a pretty good opportunity to, to grab a tip, much better and more user aligned than saying, hey, this is gonna cost you, you know, five bucks or 10 bucks. Yeah. And customers love that. And still today, I mean, about half of our customers tip, which is, uh, which is great. That's absurd. That's, uh, let me ask you a different question. When it comes to, just because you're probably an expert in this, when it comes to the bank system in general, why do you think these banks charge an overdraft? Do you think it's them signaling we don't really care about you? Or like, what do you think it is? Because obviously no. they have to look at it and go, this makes, at some point, there's a high friction. They're adding a high friction. Sure. Is that, on, is that intentional? A lot of it has to do with their heavy cost structure. So these guys are supporting 10,000 bank branches. Okay. JP Morgan Chase has 300,000 employees. Like they are just it's like an overhead, just a massive overhead. Okay. And the customers that are paying the most in overdraft fees just happen to be driving the least amount of probably overall bank revenue from loans, credit cards, other okay. areas that they want to make money from. So for them to profitably serve this customer base of younger consumers, paycheck to paycheck consumers, which is the majority of the country, yeah. they have to charge these crazy fees. Yeah, I got it. And unless you have a way to drive revenue elsewhere, they have to charge, charge the fee. Yeah. Because Dave is a technology forward company, right. we can service 8 million customers, only 300 employees. So 8 million customers, 300 employees, or you know, 300,000 employees, that alone, like forget all the innovations we've had around underwriting technology, the, just the cost difference alone allows us to offer better products at, at cheaper cost. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like at what point did you see, feel, like feel the inflection point of, okay, we tested it, we Trojan horsed it, we have X amount of users, maybe it's a thousand users, maybe less, and then you can start offering them the Dave, like the, the full service, I guess, or the full suite. Yeah, so that took us 
let's see. So we launched April 2017. We had product market fit almost right away. I mean, our CAC was like five bucks to acquire a consumer. And that was one of the big important milestones for us to prove out. Like, can this be a very low cost way to acquire users versus we know banks are paying three to $400 to acquire a regular checking account user. So that alone was really powerful. And we knew we had something we can go invest, invest behind. Then it was to go raise the Series A to try and convince investors that this is a worthwhile problem. And we pitched that vision of, hey, our next product we want to put out there is our checking account. Mm -hmm. And that was the most requested feature on behalf of our members at that time. That takes a couple of years to, to yeah. build out. And what was the revenue like pre-A? Or I guess like going into the A? Pre-A was actually pretty tough because we had a lot of product market fit requiring sure. a lot of users. You have the but signals, but not necessarily the tipping, I guess. The tipping was still proving itself out as a way to pr like actually drive more revenue than, than the losses that we were generating on these advances. Yeah. And through that Series A process, we were still losing like 20 cents for every dollar we were giving out. So the model had not been proven other than that we knew people wanted free money, which was a pretty easy thing to, to <laughs> convince people of. The Series A was damn near impossible though. I mean, trying to convince yeah. venture capitalists who have never paid an overdraft fee in their life that this is a worthwhile problem to go after when there were no other like really successful digital banking apps at the, at the time. Yeah. We got laughed out of the room a hundred times. It took like 120 meetings for us to finally get one investor that mostly liked the team. I don't think he really loved the idea that much. And after that investment was when we figured out the the loss rate, we got it down to 2%. All of a sudden the company's profitable. We were profitable in 2018 and 2019, raised money at a billion dollar valuation a couple of years later, about a year later, sorry. What was the thing that these guys didn't understand when it, like, would they just look at the deck? I'm just, I'm thinking about it. Like if I saw the deck and I, and I was just trying to quit, do quick math. Am I saying, okay, cool. The overdraft fee market is 30 billion and it takes a switch for them to make that market zero. Like how, how are they processing the VCs of the world processing this? I think their thought process was how are you going to make money off the customer? Ultimately, these are younger consumers or these customers are not making much money. Like what's the longer term lifetime value potential okay. here? VCs are also very, for better words, very herd mentality. There wasn't a lot of precedent for putting a lot of money behind sure. digital banking apps. And so we were like one of the first. Also being a LA-based company wasn't helpful at the time. LAs have much more of a... And that's kind of right before FinTech was hot. Yeah, right? it was. Because FinTech got hot like 2018, 19. Hot, hot. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So you were like early... Even like 20, yeah, 2019, 2020. Yeah, that's right. We were early. Yeah, you were super early. No one loved, no one loved FinTech yet. Exactly. FinTech wasn't a buzzword yet. That's right. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay, and so well, who invested? What was the thing? What was the thing that, like, what did people see yeah. at the end of the day? I think what ultimately happened was it was it was a team-based bet, right? The guy was still mostly looking at the the opportunity, but he liked the, the founding team behind the story. We'd all had some kind of successful exit before. We had good traction, and we had advocacy from an early seed investor who was like, look, I'm confident that these guys are going to turn this loss rate around. It's just think of their loss rate as CAC, right? Like even if you think about their, you know, the fact they already have a $5 CAC to acquire a user, right. just think of this loss rate as something that is to get someone in the door. You're ultimately going to give this person a checking account and other financial products in the future. So don't look at it that way. And mm -hmm. that finally got this one guy to see the light wrote us a $10 million check, oh, wow. and that was uh, enough to give us a significant amount of runway to really prove it out. Yeah. yeah. And What valuation did you guys do the, the A at? That was like around 40 Okay. at the time, so relatively healthy valuation Yeah. with uh, somewhat unproven profitability metrics. And from your perspective, was at that point was just the scale engineering? Pretty much scale engineering and, yeah, just just more R&D investments into yeah. building out the, the underwriting part of the business so we could profitably issue all these cash advances to, to the member base. And so what, what was the first offering that you launched with? So you closed around, you build yep. out the new offerings. What, what was the first one that would get people to, like, what was the stickiest one? I guess you probably tested a bunch of things. Well, we only had one thing, right? So effectively, the, the first launch of the app was you download Dave, you connect your bank account, and we offered two services. One was financial insights to tell you about all your upcoming bills. So that's like the Netflix water and power bill predictor type scenario. And then we had the no interest cash advance up to 75 bucks. That was the, the early launch. Okay. And the Series A was just help 
put more gasoline on an already great user acquisition funnel. So we took that business, that same thing, didn't really launch anything else additional beyond that, got to over a million users, and we raised money at a billion dollar valuation about a year and a half later. So it was yeah, a good time to raise money. Was it raise scary? Money. Were you like shitting bricks half the time? Because it's like you're on the edge to some extent. Like uh, during the A round, you're getting 100 no's. That's daunting enough. Yeah. Some people could say that's the game, which, okay, cool. It kind of is. But what is going through your head at that, at that point? Are you thinking, I fucked this up? No one gets it, or do you see it? And so you're just like, I just need to find a believer. The thing about VC, it's tough, but you just need to get one guy. Yeah. Right. You don't yeah. need you don't need twenty guys. And once you have that one, getting your they lead all join. Yeah. is so important. Getting a high quality lead. Our Series A investor ended up just taking the whole round. He's like, I don't even need other investors. Like, I I, I see it now. So he ended up owning you know, north of twenty percent of the company at that time. And. Um, yeah, fortunately, we didn't really need other investors at, at that point. And then our Series B was also just one investor that believed that Dave was a unicorn company and one check, same same kind of thing. Wow. Did Mark ever double down? Mark put more money in in a subsequent round. Sure, sure. In one, in one more round. And was your goal always to go public? Was that always clear or was that not necessarily, like did it become more clear? <sighs> Look, the best companies in the world generally end up going public. And they have fast growth, and they want to maintain their independent status. Most companies end up being public, and so did I think we'd get there that fast. I mean, in 2017, to, we went public Jan 6, 2022. That was a pretty fast turnaround for for going public. Most companies take seven to ten years, yeah. but there was a window to raise a lot of capital at a good valuation, and we took the opportunity early, even though it may you know ultimately have been too early. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing that strikes me as so interesting about your journey is just how unique it is that you were in a position to have overdraft fees uh, as as a young adult coming out of college and then in a position later on in life to actually do something about it. Yeah. I don't know that there's a big overlap between people who have overdraft fees and the, and the ability to do something about it. And so when I hear about like the hundred investors saying no, because they don't understand the problem and all these other hurdles that you had to face. I mean, you you testified in front of Congress about this, right? Yeah. Um, and I was reading that report and just thinking, how many of them truly understand the problem? They they might from talking to in constituents Congress. in, in yeah. Congress, yeah. yeah. And and is this on a societal level something that that we should put more energy towards in terms of like taking care of those who are most financially vulnerable? Because when I see your story. And I think of how it could have gone if, if you were in a different financial situation where your overdraft fees were literally digging you into a hole that you could never financially recover from. And then what are we preventing that person from becoming later on in life? And so with the lack of overdraft fees that Dave offers, that customer who could prevent that could eventually like you know go on to start his own company or her yeah. own company and you know just... It's a Start. commercial. Exactly. Yeah. I just yeah. gave you a commercial. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cue the tears. You did. No, oh I, I think God. it's uh, look, our our vision at the company is to create financial opportunity for anyone. And our mission is to build products and level the financial playing field because people are not getting access to the same opportunities. And that was that was me. Wealthy people, financially healthy people are not paying over Jeff fees. But if you are, it doesn't mean you're any, you know, less of a person, it just means you're just in a different position. You need a different product. And that was ultimately why we ended up building Dave. What was the transition like from going a CEO pre-public to now what you have to deal with today in a post-public scenario? Yeah, look, I think the big difference is you're talking to a lot more investors. That's that's for sure. Yeah. You know, before you're managing a couple investors, obviously when you go fundraising to try and raise venture capital, you're meeting with a lot of people at once. But being a public company, it's every quarter you're not meeting with a dozen or so shareholders, you're going to several conferences to go meet people and continuously tell the story because now you're managing 10,000 shareholders, not just a small handful. You're also managing employees who are constantly looking at the stock, the stock price. price yeah. And that is a very massive distraction. As far as day-to-day workload, I think being a public company has been helpful to like drive a lot of rigor on getting the quarter closed, having a really good planning session. We have uh, We use OKRs at the at the business, which is very helpful to get the whole team together quarterly, make sure we're hitting our numbers, planning. And I think that's really matured the the whole company in a way that's made us better off. Yeah. 
than being a private company. So you like it? Yeah, I like it. I think the finance team and the legal team, it's different for them because like, they've had to pick up a lot more work to maintain a public company status versus being private. Uh, for me, like my day-to-day -day job, like running the business has not changed materially sure. and hasn't necessarily got, gotten harder other than just the managing the communication piece. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to new products you guys are working on now, right? So now you gotta, you gotta get growth somewhere. Yep. And so how do you guys think about that? What initiatives, what things are you pouring money into? Yeah, so we, well, we're still investing in the, in the core offering, right? Now that we have the checking account for how all. How many users do you guys have now? Eight million customers. So it's a big base. Yeah. And we launched Dave Checking, our Dave Banking, at the end of 2021. And then last year, so that was like kind of a beta. We rolled that out so people could opt into that product as an upgraded feature. That went well. So last year, we gave Dave bank accounts to all of our members. So now every customer gets a Dave debit card. And that's a huge area of our growth is we are now a checking account that comes with best in class, what we call extra cash, which is our overdraft product where you can access up to $500 now in between paychecks to advance whenever you need it. And now people can use us to pay rent, gas, groceries, short-term expenses. You can, you can cover a lot with $500. Yeah. And that is a huge leg up over banks that still 34 bucks to overdraft as little as five or $10 in your account. Dave, you can count on this money whenever you need it. And that's a huge leg up for our, our members. Over the course of this time, has the, have the banks evolved in any way? Or are the overdraft fees still the 35 bucks? Or like, has anything changed in that world? You know, before this call, I was just going through everyone's overdraft policy just to double check. Sure. But, I mean, Chase, the same thing, it's 34 bucks. Like they'll give you until the end of the day to to, 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 to transfer some money <laughs> from into one it. of your yeah. accounts that yeah. you hold of them to the other one that you hold of them. And they go out there and they, they advertise so this to consumers. Like, oh, you know, we have this new friendly overdraft service. But if you're someone that overdrafts, you don't have the money by the end of the day. It's not about even the next business day. People, on, on average, for, for Dave, they're using our version of overdraft, extra cash, on average, like 11 days before they get paid next. So they are way far out before their next paycheck hits. So paying us back the next day. That's not a reasonable way to say, you know, we are getting rid of overdraft fees. It's still 34 bucks. They'll still charge you up to three per day, still a hundred bucks. Bank of America's made some moves to go down to $10 overdraft, but per instance, right? So they'll, they'll still hit you with, you know, two yeah. or more per they'll day. Just try it on the next day case. and then it's $10. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Exactly. And when it comes to what's working now in terms of growing from like eight to 10, let's say, is it, I know you guys are doing commercials now. Yep. Uh, probably radio, but what's the thing that you guys are doing, that, or at least the thing that you're seeing a lot of conversion from, or what's what's that's, the most effect? Social media? Are you guys on TikTok? What's the thing that's working? We're everywhere. Yeah, we're everywhere. I mean, we did did a lot of channel expansion over the last few years. So we're TikTok, we're Instagram, we're Snap, we're TV, okay. we're radio. Any partnerships? I, I could see like maybe a cool partnership with Snap. I don't know. I'm just thinking like in terms of demo, who plays better? Instagram. Instagram yeah. doesn't feel it feels a little older. Maybe TikTok. Maybe Snap. I don't know. You know, our, our age range is pretty wide. So I'd say the most popular demographic or age demographic is around 22 to 24, but 80% within the, in the range of 18 to 34, we'll say. And so they're somewhere online. They're somewhere on YouTube or Hulu or Instagram, Snap, one of these channels there, they are consuming. And where, some where are media. they usually in, in terms of like in, in the country? Are Generally they, following like city populace. So they're, they're the big cities. We have some level of small concentration in Southern markets where banks have a lot of overdraft fees more so than most. And credit scores generally tend to be lower in some of these areas. And people that have lower credit scores love our, our cash advance because there's no credit check. We don't use credit scores at all. It's all based on transaction data. When you think about the future of banking. And so when you first started the company, these companies have huge overhead, a lot, lot of locations. I probably have eight or nine bank accounts, but I never go to the bank. I don't need to go to the bank mm -hmm. ever unless you're signing a significant waiver yeah. and the, everything's just phone call based. And so when you think about, forget Dave for a second, and you think about like 2030, 2050, mm -hmm. what, what does banking look like in that world? Like what is Chase doing? Who's definitely going to be around? What is Dave doing? How do you view that? I think we'll all be using technology to greatly reduce our cost structure still. You know, I think for for Dave, we're already very lean, but how can we use technology to scale to 10 times the amount of people that we're servicing and do so with you know, very few additional employees? And that's gonna come with developments in AI that are gonna be used to have amazing customer support, 
have amazing, you know, teller personalized experiences, great underwriting experiences without really the need to interact with humans. Yeah. And the more you can do that, that just leads to a much better experience that leads to lower fees for people because it's, it's cost structure that, that creates high prices. And you guys are dabbling in the AI piece now? We do it now. So our customer support, about half our responses are from AI at this point. So that's brought our cost down tremendously. And then we have AI looking and doing all of our underwriting at the company. So when you get when you apply for a cash advance with Dave, it all goes through an underwriting model that's powered by AI. And we've been able to scale up our, our limits from 75 to 500. Just we, based on that? Based on that. And we've seen default rates go down as a result of, of the AI as well. So larger amounts, lower default rates, even with all this interest rate situation going on and inflation, yeah. you're seeing a lot of consumer lenders seeing default rates creep up. And Dave, we just reported last month, I mean, we've had record low defaults. How has the interest rate affected the business in any way, these like high interest rates? Well, the positive benefit to the interest rate is that we have a lot of deposits at the bank at, at our partner bank, and we have a rev share on 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 float. Okay. So we actually generate a decent amount of money now from just float deposit interest. Okay. But it's been so negative on everything else around the business, just because like this big macro theme that we've been sucked into. You know, we've been sucked into this consumer lender debate. Like, are consumer lenders going to have interest rates creep up significantly? I don't view us to be really a, like a, a consumer lender today in, in most respects because we give people on average a couple hundred bucks is our average advance size. Okay. The payback dates are very quick. It's all AI based. We're not giving out some like massive line of credit or right. taking huge credit exposure. We do like a billion dollars a quarter of cash advance and we do that with a hundred million dollar facility from, from Victory Park. It's a tiny little facility. Just shows how, how limited exposure we have with uh, what's going on, but given the uncertainty in the market and how risk off investors are, we just get thrown into this bucket of, you know, you're unprofitable right now, you have consumer credit risk, you're a SPAC, like, let's just sort of see how things shake out before we actually <laughs> start yeah. putting any real investment dollars back to work and something like data. Does that get to you at all, personally, or do you just, are you just pretty good at blocking it out? I'm a pretty persevering guy. I mean, yeah, it's frustrating. We were a four, we were a $5 billion company in March. So 12 months ago, yeah. we were, a, we were $5 you, billion. Today, we're like $70 million. million yeah. I mean, we're down 98%. And the company is- Good time to buy, they say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the company is significantly better off than it was when we actually went public. So that's very frustrating. Is. Business is better. Team is better. Financials are better. Loss rates are better yet you've lost like 98% of your value. Like, how does that even make sense? Right. Other than the people who were investing, supporting those valuations are just sitting on the sidelines until they know what's going to go on with potential recession. Our interest rates going to keep going up. Cost of capital is harder to access. Yeah. Well, and speaking of uncertainty in the market, we're not too far removed from the Silicon Valley Bank collapse. And I'm, I know from my understanding that it was they didn't meet the regulations in the Dodd Act where they had to, I think it was banks under $250 billion in assets, right? As a digital bank, are you subject to the same standards that, that other banks that have like physical locations and all that have to undergo? So, you know, it's important to note we're not a bank. So we actually have all our, our deposits stored with a partner bank called Evolve Bank & Trust, which is based in Tennessee, in Memphis. And they are a FDIC regulated bank. And so they have to adhere to all the regulations and deal with all the regulators okay. and take on that work for us. And that's a big part of how we're able to scale up so significantly without having a huge overhead is we don't have to deal with all that. They take that on for a percentage of our, our overall revenue. And that's a great trait because it's a lot to take on. And we just don't need that headache of, of being a, a bank in today's environment. Was that always a term, the neobank? Was that always a term, or, did, it, or is that, did that term like appear at some point of your journey? It's how we sort of describe ourselves. We can't call ourselves a bank because we're, you know, and technically we're not. Sure. Um, and so the best way to describe us is either as, you know, a banking app or a neobank or, you know, digital first. We just can't say we're a bank. Okay. So we have to figure out some alternative term. And that tends to be the way that we would describe ourselves as like a, you know, a non-bank banking institution sure will you ever do loans like sizable loans or anything like that because yeah. given if you if you have the underwriting right it seems like you could do any instrument 
That's right. Look, we're looking at every avenue of, of banking. It's an exciting place for us to expand into is, is deeper in consumer credit. We've issued 70 million cash advances now. And that all is all of those are underwritten by transaction data between six and 12 months of someone's account. So you can only imagine how many billions of transactions we've been able to use to underwrite that. So yeah, that's a big thesis of ours is like, we can use all this data to offer something like a credit card, installment loan, and do so at a significant discount to what banks are charging for that. Actually, credit card late fees are even worse than mm, overdraft fees. That's right, yeah. It's like $30 billion, $40 billion of, of credit card late fees. I think overall interest and and fees on credit cards for the lower income population in this country, it's like $120 billion a year. Yeah, it's much larger. It's, it's significant. So that's an area where- and It's definitely are, not going away. It's not going away. No. And same thing. It's it's very identical to the problem we solved in overdraft where something like a credit card has a high cost structure. Banks are giving away all kinds of these rewards and they're advertising heavily on TV. And there's so many competitive products out there that are crowding the market. But the big thing that still remains for people is how do you get more access to people that are getting rejected for these good cards? Because there's so many predatory credit products that are out there for people that are getting rejected from these things. You know, 36% APR, late fees. <laughs> I, it's, sure, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Yeah, everyone's getting one of those in their mail right now. Yeah. All right, what well, can you tell us what's on the horizon? What's the sneak peek into the future? <sighs> sneak peek, so we actually, we haven't talked a lot publicly about a new product we launched a few months ago called Surveys. So back in 2018, we launched a small feature called Side Hustle. And similar to that thing you were talking about earlier, like how can we empower like the future entrepreneurs that, that we're helping we launched something called Side Hustle, which connects people to gig economy jobs. So I'll help you get a job at Uber, Lyft, Instacart, DoorDash. And we send hundreds of thousands of job leads a month through this platform to help people get work. And people have made millions of dollars off of, uh, off of this. Do you these, vet them based on their, their credit history or anything like that? Like, or their, no, yeah. it's just like, hey, here in this location, based on this location, here's like 20 things you could go do to make an extra 20, 30, 40 bucks a day and get yourself ahead. That's pretty cool. yeah. The number one job we would send people to is at home, take home surveys. So people want to just like be on their computer or on their phone and make some money. So we launched Dave's surveys a few months ago and you can take brand surveys in the app about major brands or companies, whatever, and earn anywhere between 25 cents and five or 10 bucks a survey. And we're about to eclipse like a million dollars earned wow. from people just in our own app. And the beauty of that is that all the money that you earn on the surveys goes onto your onto your Dave debit card. So it's another reason like to engage and activate. You see your the card. feedback right away. Yeah. yeah. There's an ecosystem there. Exactly. Because awesome. these survey companies in general, they suck. Like you have to go to these third party websites, sign up, they pay you off an Amazon gift card, you gotta wait for those in the mail. Yeah. This is actual like money you can earn. So that's been pretty cool. And we're also exploring adding like high interest savings to the product too to help people or more interest, nothing, nothing crazy there, but uh, that's been something we're, we're, we're interested but, in. But better than like 0.25% or something? Yeah. 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 It's shocking. But again, <laughs> what the big banks it are is paying shocking, yeah. is nothing compared to, <laughs> it's like, what's the you know, point? You look at somebody that's in a financially better position, they're in treasuries or in money markets, they're earning four, yeah. four and a quarter. The average person is not getting that at a major bank. They're actually paying the bank all these fees. Yeah. It's so so it's true. negative interest. Well, listen, tell everyone where they can sign up for Dave. <laughs> yeah. Dave.com. Dave.com. It's easy as that. Go to, go to Dave in the App Store. But yeah, Dave.com is the easiest way to grab info about us and uh, try the service out. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, appreciate your appreciate time, Jason. Yeah, of course. Thanks a lot, guys. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over 100 episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.